Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back, hopefully, to this second installment of Poly Summer Intensive, brought to you by the Buddhist Association of the United States, the Chuanyin Monastery in Carmel, New York, the Wuju Memorial Library, my wonderful colleague, the librarian, Kaiti, and myself, Stephen Sass. And I'm so happy to be with so many of you here today. For me, it's this evening. I think probably for some of you, it's this morning. And it's just wonderful to have a global community for Pali at this kind of special time in all our lives. It's sort of remarkable to me that we have such a strong interest in what I think is the most wonderful subject. And I hope I can share some of my enthusiasm for this language with you. And I think if there's just one thing I can do to be successful with these meetings is to make you love this language and not make you think it's all about studying tables and case endings. <laughs> so I hope we have our live stream on YouTube going as well. I'd like to start with a little bit of a review because if you're a person like me, you need to hear things more than once. For me, it's more than a lot. So I will kind of call up here the poly primer and maybe I will start in the traditional way. Let me share my screen again. Okay, I think you can hopefully now see my screen. Let me try one more time. Okay. So I'll start with the traditional homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. If you had no idea what I just said, you've come to the right place. If you have an idea of what I've said, but you're not quite sure, you've also come to the right place, because I hope to tell you. If you weren't really sure what was happening, but you thought maybe I was saying something in Pali, you're on the right track. Okay. So that is the traditional way to pay homage to the Buddha at the beginning of things. It literally means homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. And Last time we were talking a bit about what Pali is and the alphabet. <clears throat> and a, two of the cases, we mentioned how there are eight cases in total in Pali. <clears throat> and we covered the first two, nominative case and accusative case. And we looked a bit at the alphabet. And I want to just look a little bit more at the alphabet. I thought maybe there could have possibly have been slight confusion about the nasals. Specifically, there seems to be a question about um, the nasals that were in the guttural family because they are notated in different ways. I hope you can all see my screen and you're not just seeing me. Okay. And so in the first category, the first group of letters in the Pali alphabet, which are sometimes called velar and also called guttural. And we mentioned how in the Pali and Sanskrit way of ordering the letters, after the vowels are done, there come these groups and they're grouped by the position in the mouth or in the oral cavity where they're produced. It's very systematic. I find it much better than 
my home language alphabet, the ABCD language, which seems to be rather randomly ordered, or at least ordered in a way that I don't understand. Now in the guttural category, the nasal which corresponds is the full nasal and it's written in different ways. One way is with an N with a dot above. Another way is actually the most traditional way to write what's called the full nasal or the nigahita in Pali. This would correspond, I believe, to the Sanskrit anusvara, which is an M dot below. Sometimes this is called M dot above. And also sometimes it's written with this special ng character, which we talked about last time, which is a lowercase curious letter, which has a lowercase n with a sort of hook on the right that looks like a g, a lowercase g. And this is how the addition that we're using online of the poly primer notates it. But within words, not at the end of words, it's either written, well, it can be written in three ways. I think the most official way would be to write it and I have a few letters, a few words here, which I've now highlighted, with an N dot above. And so we have the first word, sankara. So notice that there are three diacritical marks. This is a plural word, and the third letter is a full nasal, sankara. And the two A's are long, sankara. This is a word that is a very challenging word to translate it's sometimes translated as volitional activities, sometimes as choices, sometimes in different ways. Uh, technically, we can say that the, the word is formed by the pre prefix sung, which has the sense of together, plus a, a word which comes from the root, cur, if I can figure out. So this thing that looks like a square root sign or a check mark is how we notate roots. And they're most oftenly referring to Sanskrit roots because as Pali students, I'd like to say sometimes that we always have Sanskrit lurking in the background for us because Sanskrit and Pali are very closely related. And this root, kur, is represented usually in Pali by the verb karoti, which means to make or create. Perhaps the word create and karoti are in possibly link linked because they're in the same family. And so kara is a form of that and it means making. And so making together or creating together, putting together, this is sankara. It's a good word to know. Probably a better word than uh, dog and pig, maybe, for your poly career. Another word that has this nasal in the middle is sankappa. So notice the two Ps, which I divide, because we spoke about how a poly word with two Ps, with two consonants, should be divided at that point. Sankappa. This means either thought or intention and it's actually part of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma Sankappa. Another example, this is just the one I picked out of my head, Sankitena. It means in brief, it may look to you like an instrumental form with the ana suffix, but it's usually considered to be what's called indeclinable, which means it doesn't really have its own case. It doesn't change between cases. It stands alone. So that is hopefully a little more information about this kind of nasal and its representation on the page using the Roman letters. I will say that in the second book, which I hope to use in several weeks, which is the book by Gare and Karunatilika, they have chosen to represent this uh, sign or this sound using M with a dot below. 
So we would see something more like this. Sankara or Sangha. It's the same. It's just a different choice. And so I'm afraid there's not 100% of unified thought about how to represent, represent the sounds of Pali using the Roman letters with diacritical marks. Here's another word, anguli. It's a feminine noun. It means finger. It's, it's a common word, maybe for us, because we all have heard of angulimala, the villain, the mass murderer who gets a lot of airtime in, in Pali world. So he, a mala is like a garland and anguli is a finger. So he actually wore a garland of human fingers around his neck as a trophy of all his successful murders. Okay, now I wanted to also stress that in Pali, we have aspirated and unaspirated consonants, as we mentioned last time. And that I mentioned that the aspirated ones, which means that there's a puff of air at the, at the beginning of that letter is represented with the letter plus an H and there it's considered a one letter. And so this can lead to confusion because people maybe don't understand that and they sort of skip that letter. And then there's actually a spelling error or maybe even a type of confusion. Perhaps the most famous example of this word being misspelled, I see it all the time, is the word bhikkhu, which means monk. I have it here in sort of this phrase, which I hope to get to a little bit later. Notice this word, it, if I were to break it up as I would spell it, it would, it would be spelled, it is spelled like this. So it starts with an aspirated B, an I, a K, and then an aspirated K and a U, Biku, Biku. So those Ks are not really optional. They're actually important to the sound. So that's one example of aspirated consonants and spelling and why the K is there. Another reverse example is this phrase, which you might have chanted in your life, it's a term that's often applied to the Buddha. There are usually nine terms we use to speak about the Buddha, nine wonderful things. And this is Anutro Purisa Dhamma Sarati. And so actually Purisa Dhamma Sarati is one compound, which is something we haven't talked about yet. But in Pali, I like to say sometimes it's a bit like a Lego language. You know, Legos are those bricks that children play with. They snap together and make things like houses and dinosaurs, Legos. So just as in, with Lego, you can snap things together to make bigger things. Pali is very much the same where words sort of snap together to make bigger words. And then those words, those big words are snapped together to make even huger words. And then after a while, we, we become sort of dazzled on the page by these huge words, which take some skill to break apart for comprehension. So purisa dhamma sarati. So rati is a vocabulary word which you might have hopefully encountered in Pali Primer already. It means something like chariot. A sarata is a charioteer. And the word anuttaro means unsurpassed. The word purisa means person. And here's the trick. Notice this word, dhamma. It looks a lot like another word you might have seen, dhamma, which means the doctrine. But this is not a spelling error. This because this is not the dhamma. This is a completely different word. It means tamed. It's actually a past participle of a completely different verb. So don't worry about the meaning, but just know that this word has no aspirated D because it's a completely different word. And if I were to write this, I would be making a rather serious spelling mistake and I would be writing it a very different word. 
So this is the unsurpassed trainer of people to be tamed. So Dhamma here is tamed. So that's just a sort of a quick example of why we need to be quite attentive to our spelling, which was relying on our understanding to a certain extent about how the alphabet works. And when we get to the subject of how to look up words in a dictionary, it's very important because first of all, the Roman letter polydictionaries are generally ordered in the poly alphabet order, not in the Western ABC order. So if you don't know what letter comes next, you're gonna have a very hard time finding that word in the dictionary. Okay, so that's reviewing that. Now I thought we'd do a very quick review of the first two cases which we've covered, which are nominative and accusative. <clears throat> so as I've said, the nominative case, which is also sometimes called in some grammars, Asian grammars, the first case, because notice that, or note that these terms I'm using to describe or refer to the cases are Western terms that Western grammarians have used. They come from the West, but that's the way I've learned it. And that's the way the books that we're using are, have it. And so I'll try to maybe mention the numerical number of the case, but generally I'm going to use this Latin Greek kind of language. So the nominative case is for the subject of a sentence or, or a clause. And it's particularly if the sentence is in the active voice, it's the doer of the action. So that is nominative, the doer of the action, the subject of the sentence. The second case, case number two, is the accusative case. It's the direct object of the verb. I have actually here sort of a slightly hypothetical sentence, and I hope you've read, which we've placed on our website, my English language sort of guide to poly cases. And I have this English language sentence here, which uses pronouns in a way to try to point out the difference between nominative and accusative. So here, he saw her, but she did not see him. And I've put in blue, he and him, and her and she in red. Now notice that the subject of the first clause is he, but the subject of the second clause is she, and the object of the seeing is him. So we might say that in the first section of this sentence, he saw her, that the he, so to speak, is in the nominative case, and her is the accusative case. It's the object of the verb, saw. What did he say? He saw her. So that's the accusative. But in the second half of our sentence, the subject is actually her, but she's now the subject or the nominative case. So we change the pronoun she. It's referring to the same person, but this person is now taking a different role in this clause. It's the doer, the doer of the seeing, and he is switched to him. So in, as English speakers, we do this kind of thing all the time, sort of without thinking. Um, but we are actually assigning roles to parts of speech in this way. Now in Pali, it's usually not so dramatic in its change. It usually, as we've said, involves a type of suffix or case ending, which encodes the word with its role that it's playing in the sentence that we're reading. And so what I thought I could do quickly is I, I hope that many of you have done the examples in one and two. And if there were any questions for one and two, anything that were problematic, maybe I could take that question now quickly. So now I'm going to ask if there are any very specific questions about lessons one and two. 
and you can use your hand raising device and then I can unmute you. And perhaps for those friends who are on YouTube, my friend Kaiti, my colleague who is hopefully looking there because I'm not able to multitask so well, can report it to me or perhaps we can answer it later. So I see here one hand, one question from Vipul and let me, let me unmute. Okay, um, Vipul, are you there? Have you, are you able to unmute? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, what is your question, please? Yeah, good morning, Stephen. And first of all, thank you for these sessions. You're very uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I had uh, two questions. Okay. Uh, one, uh, the first question was, I was wondering, uh, so in this uh, primer, the first and second lessons, uh, when we did Naro Nara and uh, Narang Nare. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are all uh, nouns that are ending with the uh, uh sound. Nara. That's correct. Manusa. So I was wondering if there's a word. So I found that uh, the word for mother is Matu. So does the same rule apply to it? Does it become Mato and Mate in the same way or there's some different rule? That's a good question. And I only very lightly touched upon that, so I'm glad you're asking that today to clarify. So in Pali, we can say that nouns and other words, not verbs, are in, can fall into different classes or groups. And those groups take particular specific sets of endings. And what we're looking at here in this few chapters are called, as you said, the group of words or nouns that end in short a, uh, and they okay. have the set that we're covering. But the other word you mentioned, matar or pitar, for instance, that's a different group. They're not in this club. And so they okay. take separate endings, not okay. these endings. Okay, okay, okay. And the second question hmm. uh, was from the two exercises. So, uh, the first lesson, uh, exercise two, uh, this, uh, the translation from uh, Pali to English. And uh, similarly from uh, question five, uh, uh, the um, English to uh, Pali one. So there are sentences like yachaka bhattang yachanti. Mm -hmm. uh, where are which, you? Can you tell me where you are specifically? Uh, this is... Uh, in the accusative lesson. Uh, lesson two. Uh, okay. Yeah, lesson two. Let me question get there. Question four. Yeah. Question yeah. four. Kumara um, Sigale Paharanti. Uh, no, this is no, no, no. Uh, I mean, question four, uh, the sentence number five. Ah, Yachaka yeah. Bhattang Yachanti. Yes. So I translated this as beggars beg rice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering. Uh, Shunt bhattang also be in plural? Hmm. As in, right. I can understand in English, it will always be rice. But I was wondering, is that rule same for uh, Pali also? Yeah. Actually, so. it seems to me that the word bhattang, bhattang, you, it means more oftenly perhaps food than rice. But it seems okay. to be this kind of plural. And the, okay. the verb yachanti has the sense hmm. of begging yeah. for. Oh, and so yeah, it's taking yeah, this yeah. accusative. So that okay, is correct. Okay. So this idea of mass noun exists in Pali also. I think so. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think we yeah, can move to an, another person. Thank you for your yeah, question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Li Wen, can you unmute? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I think... Um, one of the questions has been asked. So it's about batang as well uh, for rice. So it looks like we are treat we treat that now as singular. I think so. I have okay. to say I'm not quite fully in agreement with Lily da Silva saying that it's in this group because it seems to me that it's actually a neuter noun, not a masculine. Sure. But um, I think we'll have to go with that. Yes, it, it's accusative singular right sure. yep. we don't even really say rices in english and it seems to be the same way in pali okay okay thanks okay. um i have, which is also my last questions 
Um, so for the accusative case for plural, it ends with E. So how do we pronounce that? So for example, is it nare or nare? Nare. Nare. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, if Kaiti is there, uh, and if there are any questions from the YouTube that have been entered, if you can tell me. Uh, Steve, how are you? Yeah, um, there are two questions. I sent it to your text because the second question is very hard for me to pronounce it. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Hang on a second. I will try to do the special kind of multitasking. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. I, I don't know how. I may have to do it later because I can't figure out how to get my phone to do that. No. I see the... It's too small. I'm sorry, I can't see it on my little phone. The first question is that, is there a definite, indefinite article? Oh, I see it now. I'm sorry, and yes. A man. Yes. Yeah, Polly doesn't really have those uh, an n. No, not really. There are plenty of pronouns, but not really those definite articles. No. And I see the second question, number thirteen in the second, um, the second chapter. Hold on. Kukura pabatang davanti. So dogs run to the mountain. So does this need a preposition? Good question. And this brings up an important point, which I was going to bring up, but I'm glad you did, which is that verbs in Pali, I should say, verbs of motion take the accusative as their object. They, verbs of motion take the accusative case as their direct object. And so you might think, because in English we say, he went to to the store, it would be something maybe like a dative case with this word too, but no. Verbs of motion like run and go, etc., take um, take the accusative case. Maybe she's sending me one more question. I think we have to move on because we have so much to cover. I don't know. Maybe I can't see it. Is there something you could tell me, Kaiti? about a specific number? Yeah, there is in lesson one, example one, number 12 and 15, what are Sanghaiyako and Sanghai, Sanghaiya? Yeah. Say, say the beginning in lesson one. Uh -huh. Lesson one, exam, exam one, numbers 12 and 15. Uh -huh. What are Sanghaiyako and Sanghaiya? It is a word for friend, I believe. Yeah, it should be in our book. Um, if I can go back. Yeah, if you see here on my screen, there are three words given for friend, Sahaya, Sahayaka, and Mitta. Those three all mean the same thing. The most common is probably mitta, like kalyana mitta, for friend, okay? So if there are other questions, maybe I can look later and I'll try to answer in our next session if they are still confusing, but please do look carefully at the vocabulary lists, okay? So that's chapter one and two. Now I thought what I would do to kind of give you a slight pause on the heavy duty grammar is to talk about a different subject uh, which I wanted to kind of cover quickly, which is the structure and layout of the Pali Canon, which I have to say, it seems like plenty of people are, are sort of acquainted with it, but not really sure how it all fits together. And I wanted to point out to you this very important website, which you can see hopefully on my screen, which is tipitaka.org. So www.tipitaka.org. The word tipitaka is composed of two pieces, the prefix t, which is very much like the prefix tr 
or try, which we have in English, like tricycle. And because it's not a coincidence, because we're in that family. And the word pitaka means literally a basket. But in this sense, it has an expanded sense. It means sort of a collection, sort of like, I know that if you go on a, online to do your shopping, you can put things in your shopping cart. But I've seen in the French language, they call the shopping clock cart the basket. Yeah, so it means a collection place. So this word tapitica means the three baskets. And I'll explain what that means quickly in a sec. I also wanted to show you that there are plenty of writing systems represented on this website. And so if you uh, are a person who reads these and would prefer not having to read everything with Roman letters, this could be very important for you. And, and a third thing I wanted to show you quickly, because as I said last session, I am not a computer whiz, is that if you would like to figure out one way at least to type the special diacritical letters uh, that we use in Pali, you can use this website by going to this help button over here and then it will it will tell you about the poly keyboard and you can figure it out from there and so if i was able to figure it out then pretty much anyone can figure it out because i'm not very good at this so that's one way at least to be able to enable characters the special characters you have to use a font that supports them not everyone does, especially the more unusual ones like m.below and d.below, etc. So here we're going to look at the Roman. And maybe I'll try to make this a little bigger for you. Um, what we see here is a, seri a series of files. And we have Tipitika, Mula, Atakata, Tika, and Anya. And so what we're interested in this class, of course, is the three baskets. It's also known as the root. The word mula means root. But also very important in the world of Pali study are what, what are called the commentaries. And in Pali, the word is atta kata, which is comprised of two words, the atta, which means in this sense, the meaning. And this would correspond to the Sanskrit word arta, I think. And kata means to talk about. And so it's sort of like the talking about or the discussion about the meaning. So that's the commentary, which is a very important thing to have if you're trying to translate from Pali. The tika are the sub-commentaries. And anya means other stuff, which we're not, we're not going to talk about any of these things really except for Tepitika, the three baskets. And in fact, of the three, we're really going to be talking about the Sutta Pitaka. And as you probably know, the three are the Vinaya, the Sutta Pitaka, and the Abhidhamma Pitaka. Notice the pronunciation of Vinaya. I often hear Vinaya, but if you see here, there's no long A. It's Vinaya. It's related to the Pali word Vineti, which is a, a verb which means to give up. And so it's also translated commonly as the discipline, the rules, although there's more in that pitaka than the rules. The sutta pitaka has uh, five main groups. And the abhidhamma pitaka has seven books, which we're not going to talk about at all in this class. But the Sutta Pitaka has, as you probably know, five Nikayas. So the word Nikaya means like a collection or a group. In fact, the word not only applies to text, it could apply to groups of monastics. And the five are the Diga Nikaya. So these are all good vocabulary words for you to know. Diga means long, the long discourses. The Majima Nikaya, which means the middle-sized ones, the middle-length ones, um, which are which is broken up into three groups. Strangely, perhaps, it's called the root 50, the middle 50, and the final 50. 
But in fact, there are, are 152, not 150. There seems to be something always going on in the Pali Canon with just a little bit more than we might expect. Notice here also the word, for instance, mula panasa Pali. Here, the word Pali, it doesn't mean in Pali, in the Pali language. What it means is the text, because as we said last time, the word Pali means the text. It's not really originally the name of a language specifically. In its most fundamental sense, the word Pali means row or line, like a line of text. So that's the Majima. We have the Sangyutta, which is often translated as the connected discourses. So you see this word, this piece of word yutta in the middle. This is related to the root yuj, which means in English to yoke. It's very much related to the word yoga, which we probably all know. And the word yoke, like how you would connect farm animals and yoga and yuj and yutta are all related. So they're connected together in by subject and in these five categories. And then finally we have, or not finally, but we have the Anguttara Nikaya. The Anguttara Nikaya is um, what is normally translated as the numerical discourses. It's an interesting word comprised of, I believe, anga, which means a constituent part, a piece of, an uttara. Um, and so it means something literally like going by increasing by a factor. But what it means is that each section of the book is about one more thing. So there are the, there's the group of ones, the group of twos, all the way up to 11, not 10, but 11. It goes to 11. And then finally, we have this catch-all Nikaya called the Kudaka Nikaya. The word Kudaka literally means small. In fact, it's probably the largest in terms of volume, Nikaya, but it's comprised of smaller pieces or smaller books. And some of the most famous books are here, like the Dhammapada, the Dhammapada Pali, which means the text of the Dhammapada. We have the Udana, the, sometimes translated as the exalted exclamations, Udana, Terigata, Terra, Gata, and more. So that I wanted to point that those pieces of the Pali Canon to you, so you get an idea of what it consists of and how it's laid out, and to use this very important website. Um, so I will just show you quickly, because we will probably encounter it in this very class. This is the very beginning of the Anguttara Nikaya. And notice it starts with the traditional homage to the Buddha, Buddha. And it starts by actually placing the word Anguttara Nikaya in the, I hope you recognize now, as the nominative singular. Anguttara Nikaya. Ekakanipata Pali. This is the text from the, about the chapter of the ones. Rupadivago, the chapter about Rupa and other things. And of course, it starts with the most famous phrase we've all heard before, evang me suttang. So notice here, by the way, that the word suttang has one T, but the word sutta, which we talk a lot about in Pali, it means the discourse has two Ts. So that means if we're talking about a Pali discourse, we wouldn't really say sutta, sutta. We want to say sutta. We want to divide the syllable at the double T. But here, this is not that word. This is a past participle, heard. So literally this means thus by me was heard, which is a passive voice construction, which Polly's is very fond of. And sometimes translators sort of struggle with rendering because in English, we don't like passive voice so much. So that's why you often hear, thus I have heard, right? Thus I have heard, evang me suttang. Notice here we have the 
M dot below for the nasals, the normal way. And, and you probably know who is the speaker when we, we hear the words Evang Me Suttang. It's Venerable Ananda. And notice that that word, that name, starts with a long A, Ananda. So his name is not Ananda, but the first A is long, which puts the stress on the first letter, Ananda. Okay? So that's sort of my diversion tactic, a little bit from all the grammar, but of course I've been subliminally feeding you even more vocabulary, and I hope you're enduring well. Okay, so now I'd like to go back to uh, Lily Da Silva. I don't think we need this today. Um, if I can find it. And now we'd like to talk about two new cases today. The two new cases are the instrumental case and the ablative case. If I can figure out how to manipulate my file. Yes. Okay. So the instrumental case, and we have all this interesting vocabulary, which maybe I can tell you a couple of things about too. Maybe I'll tell you a couple of things I wanted to say about the vocabulary first that you might be interested in. Let me pull up my note. So the two words here that we see, which sometimes can cause a little bit of confusion, uh, they're not actually next to each other in on the screen, but they are next to each other on my book, which are savaka and samana. Savaka here is disciple, and Samana is defined as recluse or monk. So let me call this up. And so the word Savaka is actually from the Sanskrit base, which is written like this, shrew. And it means to hear. It's actually related to the word sutang heard. It's a very similar kind of word. And so what this, but we don't have this kind of, as I mentioned last class, this kind of sibilant, this kind of S sh in Pali. And so this word shrew, or this piece of a word, becomes su, and it becomes the word, it, it's used in the word savaka. And so what a savaka is in a very literal sense is a listener or a hearer, which we might think of as a student, somebody who's listening and hearing the teacher. So that's what a savaka is in a literal sense, savaka, disciple. So disciple is fine, but you now know the sort of more literal basis of that word. And the word samana comes from a Sanskrit piece that looks a bit like this, shrum. And it has the sense of exertion or toil. And I should mention perhaps that in the sort of cultural landscape of India at the time of the Buddha, this is probably obvious to many of you, please bear with me. But there were several things going on in the religious world then. There were the Brahmins who were the priests of the sort of Vedic kind of religion and then there were religious people who stood outside of that, and they were called samanas or shramanas, the toilers, and they did not participate um, in the sort of Vedic tradition, shramana. In fact, the Buddha himself was one, because there was, of course, no Buddhism at the time of the Buddha, and he didn't immediately become the Buddha, and we hear about several kinds of groups of these sort of wandering mendicant spiritual seekers at the time of the Buddha. They were the Jains. They were the they were a group called we translate as the matted hair ascetics. And then they were what came to be Buddhists, followers of the Buddha. I think, although at that time they might have been referred to as sons of the Sakyan. 
And so the, this is the word for the strivers or the toilers, these kind of spiritual seekers. So that is how we get the word samana, which is not quite a monk. It may be a recluse or an ascetic samana. It's often combined with Brahman, samana, Brahman, recluses and Brahmins. In fact, if this word is negated with a letter A, which is a very common way of negating a word, not only in Pali, but in English, because it's an Indo-European thing. So for instance, when I use English and I can say somebody is asymptomatic without symptoms, or a piece of music is atonal without tonality. So here again, in Pali, we use this kind of negator A, and an ashram is a place without toil of exer or exertion. It's a place of refuge. It's like a hermitage. So that's the negated form. So that's even maybe too much information for you, but it, I think it might help you understand these words a little bit better. Another word that you might have scratched your head about is this word deepa, which has two definitions completely different from each other. Island and lamp. How is it possible? How could one word have these two different meanings? The reason is because we see this thing in Pali sometimes where two different Sanskrit words sort of resolve down to just one Pali word. And so the Sanskrit word for island is dvipa. But this word starting with two consonants doesn't work in Pali. That's not the Pali way. So it gets smoothed out. That's not a technical term. That's sort of my simple term. It's smoothed out. So dvipa becomes deepa. But there's another Sanskrit word, which means lamp, which is also deepa. And so we're sort of stuck in a way with the one word, meaning two totally different things. You might have even encountered this disparity if you're maybe knowledgeable about the, one of the Buddha's last exhortations to his monks when he said, strive on, be a island to yourself, or perhaps it's lamp, but I think we can say it's an island. So it would be sort of a dvipa, but in Pali it's a dipa. Okay, so that is a little bit about our vocabulary in lesson three. And I want to say now a few things about the instrumental case, uh, which is a big subject, but I'll try my best. Um, I think also that she sort of combines in this chapter two, what I would dis call distinct uses of the instrumental. One would be the word is functioning as the thing with which an action is performed. So the thing with which an action is performed is placed in Pali in the instrumental case. But there's a second sort of shade of meaning to instrumental. In fact, there are many, but we're only gonna have a few. A second one is the instrumental of accompaniment, meaning when a person does something along with another person, that's also found in the accusative, uh, the instrumental case. And it's often used with a sort of an auxiliary word, either sudding or saha. So I have a few examples here of instrumental. So here, don't worry too much about the vocabulary but I just wanted to show you some real life Pali sentences from the canon. We have here, Mahatta Bhikkhu Sangena Sadin. This is just a sentence fragment. Mahatta is a large, and as I said, this sort of auxiliary word Sadin is used for this instrumental of, of accompaniment. And a Bhikkhu Sangena, notice this Aina suffix, this is our instrumental singular. 
And although it's a group, it's, the, it's referring to the group as sort of a mass, as a gentleman said a few minutes ago. So a bhikkhu, this is actually usually represented as one word. I've just put a dash for ease of understanding. So together with a large group of monks, that's how this would be translated, together with a large group of monks, a bhikkhu sangena. So that is the instrumental uh, of accompaniment. Here is, is another one, palankena nisidea. This would mean one could sit with crossed legs. And so the with crossed, crossed legs is, is represented in the instrumental case. Um, maybe we'll skip this one out of time and we'll just look quickly because this is from a very famous sutta called the Satipatthana Sutta, Kayena Patisangvedi. So one experiences or one feels with the body, Kayena. The word Kaya is the body. It's related to the word Nikaya, which means like a body of work, a collection of texts. So Kayena is placed, this word is now placed in the instrumental and it's used uh, the, ins the body is sort of the instrument. One is feeling, one is experiencing with the body. Kayena. Okay, so maybe now we can go to our poly primer um, examples and do a few of those together. And I hope you've done them at home and I hope they didn't present too many problems. And so, as I said, we'll try to do a few. We don't have that much time to do them all. And as I said, we'll try to do in the odd number chapters, the odd number examples, unless there's a desperate confusion that people need to know. And also notice that, as I said, we're not gonna do the other way around. We're not going to do uh, English into Pali. So, I hope this is the right set. Okay, let me get set up. So perhaps we can ask for a volunteer to read for us the number one which is Pali Primer Lesson 3, translate into English, um, uh, exercise number one. If somebody would, would like to try it, they can raise their blue hand. Okay, I think we have a volunteer. Okay, hang on. So I think we had this person last time, um, Emily. Um, I hope I'm not messing up your name. But Emilia. Says Emilia, I'm sorry. Can you read number one in Pali for us and then give us a translation? Yes. The, the, um, uh, given the translation. But, Please read it in Pali first. Buddho sabakehi. Sadin Vaharem Gachadi. Yeah, Buddha Savakehi Sadin Viharang Gachati. The Buddha goes to monastery with the disciple. Yes, the Buddha, that's the nominative. Notice the O suffix. Goes, we go right to the verb then, they because these go together. And notice it's expressed in the singular, third person singular. And then the object of the verb, verbs of motion, as I said, take the accusative as it's as their object, viharang, the monastery. And then we have our piece of instrumental, savakehi sadding, together with disciples. 
Very good. Okay. Maybe we'll try now um, uh, the next person, Golfin. If you're there, can you read and translate number three? Uh, can you hear me, Stephen? Yes, I can. <laughs> Kasako sarena sigalang wijaki. The farmer shoots uh, the, the jackal with arrow, with an arrow. Yes, good. So the the farmer kasako is represented in the nominative case, and that we go right to the verb. This verb means to shoot. I don't know why, but it seems like a lots of lots of examples in Pali primer have a sort of a violent nature, shoots the sigala, which is a jackal. Notice it's expressed in the accusative, the object of the verb with that ung ending. And we have a further piece of information of how it was done, how it's being done with asara, which is an arrow. Here is ac actually, I might quickly mention that the word sara, which means in a literal sense, a reed or perhaps an arrow can also mean a sound like a vowel. In fact, vowels in Pali are called sara, sara, because again, there are two words that are resolving down to one Pali word. So svara would be the sound sara because svara can't stand in that way in the Pali language. Okay, I seem like we have run out of people already. No one else would like to volunteer to do an example. No more hand raisers. Or perhaps I'm not seeing them. Oh, we have somebody, but a member I asked, please put your name in a way that looks like a name. I can't call on you if you're an abbreviation. And you can easily rename yourself in the box. So let's hear. We have Catherine. Are you there? Yes. Can yes. you do for us, please, number five? Okay. Putta Padehi Kukure Paharanti. Sons. This is a kick or hit. The dogs with feet. Padehi is with the feet. Right, good. So here, puta padehi kukure paharanti. So here we have a nominative plural that is because we have a long A and it's matched here in the verb with the anti ending. The N is inserted there to give us the plural because the subject and the verb have to match that way. The object of the verb are dogs expressed with the E ending dogs. And then we have here our instrumental plural pa dehi with feet. So they're striking the dogs with their feet. And maybe we'll try one more. Um, lab labanya. Um, yes, can you hear me? I can. Would you do number okay. seven? Yeah. I'm sorry, number nine. Oh, okay. Kasako avatang uruhati. Kasako means a farmer. Avatang. Do you know what the word means? Did you do your homework? Um, I forgot the meaning of avatang. Uh, what does the verb mean? Oruhuti. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, okay, or, I'll, um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So this sentence, kasako avatang oruhuti, is the farmer descends to the pit. And so this seems to be another verb of motion and it's taking an accusative as its object and it's a singular to the pit, P-I-T, like a hole. 
It's a rather obscure kind of sentence. Okay, so maybe, maybe that seems to be enough. Um, um, and then we can talk a little bit in the remaining few minutes about the next case I'd like to talk about, which is the ablative case. And maybe we will review this, these two cases again in our next class. So the ablative case. And this case is put here, I think, because it shares a case ending the plural with the instrumental. So notice that there are some family resemblances here uh, when we look at our cases. And in terms of our vocabulary, I think nothing too exciting to report, but notice, notice that we have the, ver the word pitaka, the basket, which we were just talking about. And we have the word upasaka, a lay devotee, a lay follower. A female one would not be in this class because remember, we're talking about a class of nouns which are masculine ending in short a. And so in a pasika, which would be a female lay devotee, would be in a different class. It would be feminine. So important thing to know about the ablative case is that there is kind of a whole variety of possible endings for the singular. There are three here. In fact, there's another one, which she doesn't even tell us about for now. And a common question I get is, what's the difference? And the answer is not very much. It would seem that, and maybe we talked about a little bit in the last session that um, that Pali was sort of uh, brought together from a variety of different dialects. And it is possible that this kind of variety of suffixes would represent these different, slightly different suffix uh, dialects. But I'm not sure for the full reason. But in any case, we do have these three possibilities for ablative singular, but they don't give any difference in meaning from each other. So don't think you'll sort of find a shade of meaning when you find mha versus sma. It doesn't really work that way. They all seem to be uh, the equivalent in meaning. They're just varieties. And I would also say that she gives this alternative ab instead of the normal ehi but I've almost never seen it. So don't, don't even think about it. It's always pretty much ehi as ablative plural. So the ablative case is the case, well, the easiest way I like to say is that ablative means away, ablative away, or it means going away from, but perhaps a more formal definition I can tell you here is the point starting from which an action proceeds. I'll say that again. So ablative represents the point starting which from which an action proceeds. So it has the sense of moving away from. It also can take another sense, which is because of or through. And I have an example of that. I'd like to show you quickly. Um, if I can find it. So here's a few ablative examples uh, from the Pali Canon, not just about pits. So here we have Tina Midda Chittang Parisodehi Deti. Tina Midda Chittang Parisodehi. So the purified the mind through or of. Tina and Midda, which is sloth and torpor. So the purifying of the mind from Tina Midda, that is represented in the ablative. Or here, Asavehi Chittang Vimuchi. So the mind liberated from the Asavas, 
the asavas sometimes translated as the taints. Here is an ablative plural. So it doesn't always have the sense of a sort of spatial moving away, but it has also the sense of a kind of conceptual moving away from, asavehi, from getting rid of or from the asavas. Another sense, as I mentioned, has, this, has the sense of dependent um, or because of. And these two sentences are from what's called in Pali, paticca samupada, or dependent origination. And so two bits of it is vedana pachaya tanha, tanha pachaya ud, uda, uda, uda dana. Oh, I think that's not right. We'll take that out. Let's just stick to Vedana Pachaya Tanha. So here, because of feeling, there is craving. So the sense of here is through or because of this word is, is represented in the ablative. So that's a second sense, but a very common one if you're a Pali chanter. So now you'll know that when you say Vedana Pachaya Tanha, you're using, well, these are two nouns that are in the feminine, but, and then this word is represented in the ablative. But maybe we'll do a few of the Pali primer to sort of get it squared away. Okay. And again, I will try to ask for some volunteers to help me do some examples. So please put your hand up if you'd like to help read off and do an ablative sentence. Okay, Vaibhavi, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Can you do for us, for us now, we're doing exercise lesson four, yeah. ablative. The, the, we'll do the second sentence. Sure. It's Dharako Matulasma Odanam Yachati. So the boy asks for rice from the uncle. Mm hmm. Right. Or food from the uncle. Right. Exactly. So it, very good. Thank you. So we see here the nominative singular darako met with the verb. Oop. The object of that verb odanang, food or rice, and then we have our ablative from matulasma, from the uncle. So notice here we're using the sma version, the sma, the sma variant from the uncle. Good. And then maybe we can try Surya Kumar. Yes, sir. Can you do for us um, number four? Matula Satake Do Wanti. In fact, this one doesn't seem to have an ablative, but tell us what it means anyway. Did you do it? Did yeah. you do it in advance? Yeah. Uh, okay, what does it mean? I can't hear you. Okay, I'll tell you. Matula is the plural nominative for uncles. It's the same word as in number two in a different case. Here it is in nominative plural. Dovanti is the verb to wash in also the plural. Notice the anti suffix. And then we have here an accusative plural, satike, garments. But that one, this sentence has no ablative. So let's try, we can try someone else. Um, I've unmuted Huang. Yes. Can you read for us number 
6 and translate it? Sure. Upasaka samanehi sadim viharasma nikamanti. Uh, lay devotees live with the recluses from the monastery. Yes, very good. So here we have all our cases in one sentence. So we have a nominative plural, upasaka, lay followers, nikamanti, they leave, that's with the anti plural. Then we have our ablative here, from the vihara, vihara sma, and then we have our instrumental of accompaniment with that sort of special word sudding together with summon, samanas, so represented in the instrumental plural, samanehi. So to get, together with monks, okay, very good. Is there anyone else who'd like to try one on this Zoom meeting? I think I see Golfin. Are you there, Golfin? Yeah. Okay, can you do for us number eight? Kumara Mitehi Saha Upalang Pasanti. Yeah. Boys sees uh see the king with uh, his friend. Yes, very good. All right, so again, we have our nominative plural with the verb at the end. They, are, they see the accusative singular, a version of the word for king. And then we have our instrumental of accompaniment with friends. So the boys see the king along with their friends. Okay. So I think we're pretty much almost out of time. If you have any uh, questions, you can ask them in our next session for these two uh, chapters. But I'd like to, because now we're gonna have a gap of several days until next week. So if you would like to stay with me, I would like to then move on and cover in our next session, the next two cases, because we're kind of, in a way, it seems we're moving fast, but in another way, we are moving slow. We are, in a way, taking the slow launch to understand the cases. Because if we had started with some other books, we would get all eight at once. But we're trying to sort of slow that down. And so in the next class, which will hopefully be on Monday, I'd like to do dative and genitive. Some grammarians say that dative and genitive are sort of almost one case in Pali because they share so many of the endings in so many different groups. And it's very hard sometimes to sort of uh, dis to discern if it's dative or genitive. But we'll take a look at that together. Okay, so Maybe now I'll ask if there's any more questions uh, in general for anything I've covered in today's session, or if there's a, an outstanding question from YouTube that has arisen, maybe Kaiti can tell me. Kaiti, are you there? Yes, hi, Steve. Uh, there's a question about, hold on, I have to go back. Um, I think the men, okay, uh, a person is asking, can we have the answers for the given exercise? <laughs> can we have the answers, meaning without doing them? Well, as I've said, there is a published answer key. I don't think it's freely available online. But again, if you are doing them at home, as I hope you are, and if you're not sure, please ask me. This would be a good time. But I don't have... Uh, an answer key to just hand out to you, I'm afraid. But also keep in mind that these are not poly canon sentences. These are sort of made up sentences to help us get a handle on the way the cases work, right? Okay, but let's take one more from here. Um, Ava Chu. 
Yes, Stephen, this may be a very dumb question. Um, you mentioned last time that Pali was a speaking language. Then how does it develop? Or how did it develop into what we are doing right now? How did it develop into what we're doing right now, meaning the Pali primer? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what happened was in a very quick and sort of simple explanation, I'm not an expert, is that all languages in India at that time were entirely oral. There was no writing. For instance, the Vedic literature, like the Rig Veda, was not written down probably for like well over a thousand years, which means that people's memories were pretty extraordinary. And what happened was that after the Buddha died, they got together, meaning the most prominent monastics and had a council, a big meeting, big arahant meeting. And they decided that they ran through, so to speak, all the discourses that the great memorizers had heard and memorized. For instance, Venerable Ananda, as I mentioned, recited them and they sort of divided them up into groups of or teams of memorizers. It's sort of like they might've said, okay, you guys, I want you to remember this stuff. And then you guys over there, I want you to remember this group of stuff. And then they would recite them together for many years. And then eventually as this teaching, which was entirely oral, which is a little bit hard to grasp, was disseminated to places over time when there was writing, they were written down. And they were written down on supports that were not very durable. And so those supports crumbled, but then they were written down again on other supports. Um, and eventually they were written down in ways that we can look at today. So that's a very quick answer. I hope it sort of begins to answer your question. I have one more question from Rob M. Hi, Stephen. Um, could you quickly switch back to the examples you gave of the ablative, the Word document that you had? Um, okay, why? Because there was one, the first example did not seem to have, a, didn't match the endings that I was expecting. Okay. Um, the Parisodeti, um, is that the Ending for ablative, the... No, no, the ablative word is tina midda. This is a verb. Ah, okay, that's the verb. I'm okay, glad okay. you asked that question. Okay, no, this I'm is the verb. Oh, okay. So oh. then how do we know, because the in the ablative um, ending with the A, long A, same as plural, and as you mentioned, the dative and ablative have many of the same endings. When doing a translation, how do we know which is which? through context okay you can tell through context you get a feel for the language it all i mean so is that always accurate or sometimes it messes you up it could mess you up but hopefully not because we have plenty <laughs> of good translations already which we can refer to okay thank you very much you're welcome well, i think maybe one more question then i have to go from therapy if you're there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, do we worry about the tenses when we translate? Okay, I'm gonna mute you because I have a lot of noise, but I heard your question. The question was, do we have to worry about the tenses? But so far we've only have one tense and two, one person. So everything we've done so far is third person, present tense, either singular or plural. But of course there are many other tenses and there are two other persons, first and second, singular and plural. So we have two of six of those and several other tenses. And so we're trying to do a slow curve here and not overload you with too much information at once. So that's why so far we've only been presenting or the book has only been presenting the present indicative, third person singular or present indicative, third person plural. Okay, 
I think we're going to have to leave it there. We're actually over the time. I'd like to thank you all very much for attending my class. And I would like to mention quickly a very important class, which is given every Saturday morning by my teacher, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, on the Anguttara Nikaya. So this is not a Pali class. It's a Sutta study class. But he makes lots of mention to the Pali words because he translated the book. And he's an expert. And so I can heartily recommend his Saturday morning Sutta study class. And you can find all the information you'd like about this class on our monastery's website, uh, www.baus.org. That's baus.org. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope to see all of you again on Monday for our next installment of Poly Summer Intensive. Thank you very much and have a good day.